<coughs> All right. So, yeah, I will start uh, to my presentation right now. But yeah. So, can you see my uh, screen? Yeah, yes, we can. Okay. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm Janesh, and today I'm going to give a presentation uh, named Protocells and their importance at the beginning of life. I'm a student at uh, Yulis Technical University, uh, which is located at Turkey, and I'm studying in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics here. So, so let's talk about um, the contents uh, of this presentation. I've divided um, into many parts of um, many parts of this presentation. So actually, we will start with the definition of life and its properties, and then we will follow. After that, we will follow the encapsulation and the importance of encapsulation. And then we will follow, uh, we will move on to uh, protocell structure and characteristics and their uh, importance. Then we will finish the presentation. So, what is the definition of life? Uh, so, actually, the, uh, defining life has been a major problem for many scientists, actually. Why? Because there are so, ma so many exceptions uh in defining uh, life uh so actually at least we have a definition of life so uh, it is stated by nasa that life is a chemical system that self-sustains and it is able to undergo darwinian evolution so what did you understand from this definition so it's actually uh, emphasize the chemical system that self-sustained and Darwinian evolution. So what's a chemical system? I want you to uh, think a, uh, a cell and energy input and energy output. So uh, we need uh, energy to, to carry out our metabolic pathways, metabolic reactions, uh, our chemical reactions. So uh, actually we need to uptake um, energy and this energy inside of us, uh, inside of our cells, uh, will be consumed or transformed into um, different uh, variations of energy, and it will be <coughs> um, it will be waste products, uh, such as um, as an energy output. So, as a basically, it's a, a chemical system is based on energy transformation so it should be self-sustained and what about darwinian evolution so it um, means uh, actually a selection process um, so <clears throat> it should be selection process because you know um, our genetic materials <clears throat> should be uh, transferred to our uh, daughters uh, our, <clears throat> our daughters and um, it can be uh, in this way it, um, life can be sustainable so without sustainable uh, life cannot be occurred so um, by moving this uh, from this uh, uh, by moving from this definition actually we can say life should has three main properties such as so as um, self-replicated polymers, um, and you know, um, these are known as DNA and RNA. You can think, uh, think of them as um, systemic memory or genetic material, whatever you wanna uh, think. Um, and the other ones are known as metabolic machineries, uh, such as proteins, and you know, proteins uh, functions in different uh, structures, such as enzymes and hormones in our body. And the last one is compartmentalization. So I'm not talking about just uh, phospholipid layer membrane. I'm talking about uh, 
compartmentalization. It can be uh, <clears throat> it can be made by membranes and uh, different vesicles. I, we will talk about this uh, in detail later. Uh, and uh, compartmentalization is main topic of this presentation. So what is compartmentalization? Actually, I want to begin the meaning of these terms, uh, basically. So yeah, uh, we have house, we have our own house. And in this house, actually, we have <coughs> rooms, right? So we can call these rooms as compartments, the smaller compartments of our houses. And they have their own uh, properties, they have on their functions right they have um, in we can organize uh, our house uh, in this way uh, much more effective uh, we can uh, um, um, we can organize our house in a or in order more order actually so but uh, it can be more complex uh, so if you think a city, uh, your house is a very, very smaller part of your um, part of um, part of compartments, right? <clears throat> so I just want you to understand the compartmentalization concept in, in there because compartmentalization is everywhere you see in our body, in our cities, in our on our earth. There, there are everywhere. So, uh, so let's look at the concept of encapsulation. So, <clears throat> encapsulation. I, as I mentioned before, I don't want you to um, just think of phospholipid layer membrane. It can be a soup bubble maybe because you know um, soup bubbles are actually consist of. Um, monocarboxylic acids, and actually they can create vesicles, which, uh, <clears throat> which is um, includes a thin layer. Uh, and inside of this thin layer, there is a water. And outside and um, inside of this surface, there are there is a air. So actually, maybe, maybe it can uh, <clears throat> compartmentalize uh, some molecules, some chemical molecules, and uh, make some things, some molecules more order. Maybe in these vesicles, um, chemical reactions can be uh, occurred at um, um, at higher concentrations. <clears throat> so uh, there, are, there is a. The importance of encapsulation, uh, which I want to, there is the importance of encapsulation, which I want to, uh, I want you to uh, be careful about that, because <clears throat> actually, what do I mean by the importance of encapsulation? So why do we need that? Why do um, encapsulation is as seen as um, requirement for life? So basically, with uh, encapsulation process, uh, <clears throat> you actually uh, you are creating micro environments, and inside of this micro environment, you have catalyzed regions, solutes, biopolymers together at defined concentration. There is this is more, very important because. Uh, at defined concentrations, actually, you are creating limit, limited space and you are creating a chemical network which, uh, which determines your um, cell's identity, all right? So, <clears throat> so with um, this uh, encapsulation process, actually, you are creating chemical systems under confinement and with this way, uh, <clears throat> with this way, chemical reactions can be occurred uh, in much more efficient way. Several experiments have been um, conducted, 
and they show that um, the rate of chemical reactions is accelerated due to um, confinement. So um, if you think that, let me give you an example of that. So there's an example. Uh, let's imagine that you have a coffee, you have a, a cup of coffee, and you want to you want to add the sugar, a cube of sugar into it. So yeah, you can add it and you can taste that, and you can say that oh, uh, it includes a sugar. But um, if you add three more cube of sugar into this solution, you will taste this uh, sugar. Uh, much more than you uh, did uh, with one sugar, one cube of sugar, right? So it's about that actually. Uh, if you have more conde condensed, more limited space, actually your chemical system will occur uh, much more in an efficient way. So with um, encapsulation, we are keeping our chemical network. Um, at defined uh, concentrations. So there is a, a sentence which I write down uh, this. So you can see it's a prerequisite for molecular evolution. Why? You can ask why, and I can answer that. Um, it's uh, because uh, while actually you are, uh, we have. We need um, life should has a um, chemical network and information encoding polymers, right? We we need to we need our genetic material. In this way, we can uh, we can be alive, right? We uh, our genetic uh, information can be carried out, um, um, can be uh, transferred to our next generations. So actually, with encapsulation, you are protecting your genetic material. Uh, protecting genetic material is very vital for us because um, with protection, actually, you allow a few modifications on your genetic materials to occur. So yeah, uh, actually, uh, when few medic modifications uh, happens, on your genetic material. So, uh, so uh, with these uh, modifications, um, your, uh, your cells will divide into uh, the, outer the outer cells and uh, it will transfer your genetic materials uh, with different, uh, it will uh, transfer your genetic materials uh, to next generations and these next generations uh, will form um, different variants of protocells. So um, among, among these uh, uh, different variants, um, if there is a highest, um, if there is a protocell which, have, which has a highest um, fitness, uh, it will eventually uh, will be selected over all over them. So uh, uh, selection process, molecular evolution will be happened at this place. So uh, actually, I can emphasize the importance of encapsulation by uh, saying this sentence, and you can see the schematic version uh, of what I said uh, right now. So you can examine this. Uh, schematic version. So as a basically, uh, we predicting our um, model cell to be like, look like this. Actually, you can see there are, there is inside of cell, there's a, a genetic material and metabolic machinery, and there are uh, energy transfers, and there are transports of chemical molecules and ions, and there is a boundary system. So at last, uh, we have arrived our main topic, and it's um, protocell models. 
So what should the characteristic of the protocell model uh, of the protocell be? So its boundary system should be both dynamic and stable. Why? Um, because um, uh, actually your um, boundary system uh, should um, should allow transportation of ions and different um, nucleotides or sugars and uh, different biopolymers and if you don't allow um, if uh, if any protocell allow uh, transportation it means nothing because there should be energy transfer uh, between uh, between cell and environment in this way uh, actually we can carry out our metabolic pathways and it should be uh, stable to and because um, at high temperatures actually we don't want uh, we don't want uh, our protocells um, to be disrupted so it should be both dynamic and stable it should be permeable to molecules such as nucleotides and sugars yeah because these are known as um, life's building blocks you know that and it should be permeable we don't mean uh, both dynamic and stable. Um, actually, we don't mean uh, a isolated system. It should be permeable to uh, nucleotides, sugars, biopolymers. So uh, the another one is periodically plausible. So yeah, actually, <clears throat> in contemporary biochemistry, uh, we have uh, some biochemical molecules. We can have chemical molecules or uh, different things. But uh, um, this actually maybe this can uh, couldn't uh, exist in um, a prebiotic world. So uh, actually, biochemistry was different than uh, we have we had right now. So uh, we cannot expect uh, phospholipid um, formation of phospholipid layer membrane in the um, prebiotic world. So it should be prebiotically plausible. And the other one is self-production. So yeah, your vesicles should um, uh, grow and divide it into uh, different, uh, different, um, cells because in this way you can transfer your genetic material to next generations and actually your genetic material that uh, there should be a compatibility uh, between your genetic material and your um your membrane actually yeah so if there is not a compatibility between your genetic material and um membrane there cannot be a, a a good explanation for self production all right so i will uh, move on to next topic so there's a voice which All right. Oh, all right. I will continue. Right. So I, I see this um, mysterious unsolved problem as a jigsaw puzzle. So we need to develop um, great methods to solve this problem. So what can we do? Actually, we have uh, more organized, more ordered, and um, less chaotic earth right now and we have uh, more complex uh, cells and their membranes so uh, compared to periodic world and primitive memory so you know uh, periodic world had uh, uh, more chaotic and more disordered uh, environments and primitive ones are less complex uh, compared to uh, modern cells so what can we do about that? What can we do is 
uh, based on uh, <coughs> putting together um, into these each parts, uh, putting uh, these each parts together um, to make um, to uh, to puzzle, to make puzzle, and in this way we can <coughs> we can solve this problem better, and uh, actually making puzzle actually we can uh, we need to understand each part's unique unique properties right so with this way we can understand a primitive world and primitive membranes better or we can disorganize we can break uh, this puzzle and we can um, Again, look at the, each part and the, its role on in um, on Earth, organized, more organized or Earth, so we can understand better this process because there should be a transition between them. There should be similarities between them because our life is universal and we we share we are sharing. Uh, a lot of similarities between um, primitive primitive mem primitive uh, cells and modern cells. Sorry. So um, before beginning to uh, explain protocells and their uh, structures, <clears throat> I just want to uh, give a, a brief information about primitive world and its uh, characteristics. So, uh, primitive world has an atmosphere with nitrogen and carbon dioxide, and there was no oxygen, and uh, there was a um, high temperature environments, such as hydrothermal vents, which is a, a seen as a candidate for um, candidates, which is a um, uh, host the uh, origin of life maybe <clears throat> and there was a salty ocean as you can see and uh, this salty ocean actually is a major problem for origin of life why i just want to, to give an example a uh, beautiful example of uh beautiful example to um, explain this uh, better so you can see uh, these are known as decanoic acids. So decanoic acid is a uh, fatty acid, and they can assemble into vesicles at uh, suitable conditions. And <clears throat> uh, decanoic acid, most of decanoic acid is delivered by meteorites. So they are available uh, at the periodic world. So <clears throat> actually, um, um, less diluted solution. Um, so there was a, a less salt concentration. At less con high, less uh, salty concentration, you can see the conic acid can assemble into vesicles. But um, at high concentrations of salt, as you can see, uh, the conic acid can precipitate as crystals because there are uh, divalent cations and electric electrostatic interactions between um, <clears throat> fatty acids and um, salts. So these divalent cations actually inhibit the stability stability of fatty acid membranes, and this uh, problem. So plain plate tectonics is another one, and plate tectonics have just begun. Uh, periodic world and has an important role um, in the at the beginning of uh, life. <clears throat> so yeah, I will. Sorry, I wanted to, to share a study uh, with you <clears throat> because I will talk about um, release and uptake of contents uh, such as uh, genetic materials and um, solutes maybe so <clears throat> as you can see um, fatty acid vesicles 
it can be formed, can be uh, assembled into vesicles, but at high temperatures, actually they convert it into oil droplets. So this is a problem. It, it seems as a problem because uh, we cannot see encapsulation uh, with oil droplets. So um, it, it seemed to a problem uh, to scientists, but there's a study which you can see the image I took uh, from this study. Um, they, um, <clears throat> site, uh, they actually did the thermal this pro this thermal process uh, to understand the eff uh, effect of temperature on fatty acid vesicles. So uh, when they um, increase the temperature, they they saw that um, the fatty acid vesicles are converted into oil droplets. And then they reverse the process and they decrease the temperature. And they then they saw that actually there was an uptake of contents. And uh, actually uh, thermal cycling did not disrupt the encapsulation process. So there was an uptake and release of contents, which is very useful for uh, encapsulation. So, uh, <clears throat> and you know, we just, uh, we are not just talking about fatty acid vesicles. Uh, there are a lot of fatty acids and <clears throat> um, with different composition actually, uh, we can see that thermally enhanced membrane can enable content release and uptake. And actually, environment conditions such as buffer composition, so uh, can affect stability of primitive memories. What uh, what did I mean by uh, by that? So actually, uh, they tried uh, <clears throat> to look at the effects of trees and water on membranes, and they see uh, that these buffer composition actually affected. Um, the stability, stability of primitive membranes. <clears throat> and there is another uh, beautiful findings which I want to share with you. <clears throat> so as you can see, there are uh, different, compo there are fatty acid vesicles with uh, different composition. So they just did the same process again. And as you can see, the outer protocells are different mixtures of their parent protocells. So actually we can say that we see um, a selection process there. So another uh, cycle is wet, uh, called wet dry cycle. So you know this process, I don't want to uh, explain that, but there is a rain and there, there are some rainy days and there are some sunny days and it will affect your uh, water water condition. So um, is, let, let's assume there are vesicles inside of water and these uh, ones encapsulated, encapsulated uh, contents, right? So then sunny days, it will uh, go up to air and it means uh, your water will be more salty or more um, uh, will have more uh, will have more concentration right and we call that flocculation so it seems inevitable but uh, actually um, did it uh, disrupt the um, encapsulation process which is um, encapsulation process. Uh, so actually they found uh, it did not. So uh, there, are, there were some uh, transfer of contents between them, but it did not disrupt the um, encapsulation process. But when 
complete dehydration uh, be, um, happens. Uh, maybe, um, sorry, not maybe. Um, they found that uh, the encapsulation process is disrupted. So, but uh, they did this process with fatty acid vesicles. What about phospholipid vesicles? So actually, when they uh, did this process with phospholipid vesicles, actually they are they they have seen that for um, vesic phospholipid vesicles are more resistant um, to these wet dry cycles uh, compared to fatty acid vesicle, and it can be uh, a step to our modern membrane. And as you can see. Um, and maybe um, this can be a driving force. Uh, this can be an advantage of selection of uh, phospholipid vesicles over the fatty acid vesicles. So yeah, I will talk about right now uh, periodic lipid compartments. So uh, there are a lot of uh, pre uh, protocell models. I want to sh uh, I want to start with periodic lipid compartments. So yeah, I will start uh, uh, fatty acids, and they are known as most plausible ones. So they are permeable to transportation of ions. They are allow um, they take longer polymers into them, but they have some um, drawbacks. They have some disadvantages. So they can be only from specific pH, specific pH, and they can be affected by electrostatic interactions such as divalent cations and uh, salts. And they can be disrupt. Uh, they can be uh, converted into oil drugs, as I mentioned before, uh, at high temperature, and it can be problem. But there are different, different um, variants of fatty acids and which are known as monoalkyl phosphates and monoalkyl glycerols. And uh, actually, if you add uh, monoalkyl phosphates or monoalkyl glycerols into your fatty, fatty not into, um, into the membrane of fatty acid, acid vesicles, actually you can see uh, they have enhanced stability. Uh, they have enhanced stability compared to pure, uh, compared to stability of pure fatty acid vesicles. So this is very important because several experiments shown that actually which you, when you prepare a fatty acid uh, vesicles, um, consist of fatty acids, monoalkyl glycerols, and alcohols have um, is more stable is and is more permeable at uh, high temperatures and uh, extreme environments such as hydrothermal vents, and it's very important. So, uh, and there is a phospholipid one. So phospholipid one. So actually, phospholipids are not uh, seen as a appealing candidates of prebiotic lipid compartments. Why? Because with phospholipids, actually, you create a rigid membrane, and it uh, actually do not allow a transportation. So and it it is um, they are less available in prebiotic world, and they create a slow dynamic. So they are not as seen as uh, appealing candidates. So yeah, um, we will look at the modern membrane evolution. So we have, let's assume that uh, we have a fatty acid vesicles. So what about we uh, add some phospholipid layer into them? So actually, um, there will there will be a change uh, because uh, we now we have a phospholipid layer. There should be transition 
there should be a transition to phospholipid uh, layer from fat acid vesicles. And there should be, a, I think, um, there should be a selection advantages uh, of phospholipids over the fat acids, fat acids. So, right, you can see. And um, it is um, discovered that actually, um, with more phospholipids, actually, it will, it will these uh, fat vesicles will be more will be become less uh, permeable. Uh, it, it will be semi permeable, more semi permeable, and with this phospholipid layer, it will grow much faster. So this can be seen as um, selection advantage, or maybe as I mentioned before in uh, wet dry cycle part, maybe phospholipid vesicles are um, more resistant. So uh, this can be a selection advantages. This is an advantage, sorry. So uh, I will move on to non-lipidic prebiotic compartments. So uh, first one, uh, known as alpha hydroxy acid. So actually with the uh, alpha hydroxy acids, you are creating membranous micro droplets. And actually uh, they are produced with amino acids and they will create membranous micro droplets and uh, they will give uh, a polymerization of polyesters and which these um, polyesters will assemble into uh, vesicles. So uh, it has been observed that alpha hydroxy acids can accumulate RNAs and it is uh, important. So I will uh, look at conservates uh, lastly. Uh, of non-lipidic prebiotic compartments. So uh, operin, you know, Alexander Operin has a uh, genius ideas about origins of life. And uh, he proposed that cons conservates can be uh, first protocells, uh, first steps of life. Uh, so with new fi findings, actually, we can uh, we know that ribosin, which is a um, uh, RNA with enzymatic activity, is increased in conservates. Ribosome activity is increased in conservates compared to no vesicles. No vesicles. So it's very important. And um, we can see, as you can see the, from this image, uh, non-enzymatic polymerization of RNA can be happened, can be occurred, and uh, conservatives can retain larger RNAs and can accumulate them. It's very really important too. And uh, actually, uh, they are tr they tried to uh, they tried um, to make lipid vesicle coated uh, complex conservatives. Why did they? Uh, why is it is important actually? As for me, uh, we can observe some um, phase liquid liquid phase behavior uh, in in our cells actually. So uh, I took this image from a, a study and it shows uh, a phase behavior um, in. Senopus levis ossids, actually. So we have uh, these behaviors in our cells, and maybe lipid vesicle coated complex, complex conservatives can show, uh, can help with um, better understanding uh, of this non lipidic prebiotic compartments role in our cell or in origins of life. So in this image, and again, we can observe longer RNA molecules have more net charge because uh, I didn't mention uh, at first place, but conservatives 
are um, formed by polyanion interaction of polyanion and polycation. And uh, longer uh, with longer RNA molecules have more net more net net charge, uh, they will be selected over smaller oligonucleotides, and they will return they will ret uh, they will turn into uh, complex RNA functions. And uh, it's very important as you can see because uh, in this way maybe our metabolic pathways and our genetic material. Um, have been functionalized. So uh, I will come to the end actually. Uh, so this is our uh, um, history. You can see habitable world and there are some periodic synthesis happened. And this, with this periodic synthesis, actually polymers and vesicles are formed and they formed protocells and these protocells um, uh, triggers the um, LUCA, which is known as um, the first ancestor. So lastly, actually, I just wanted to uh, emphasize the role of role of photocells on um, potential uh, role of uh, photocells on the environments of other planets. So. Why is it important? Because if we understand the biochemistry are uh, protocells in prebiotic world, maybe we can uh, trace the uh, life on different planets, such as Mars, on different moons, such as en Enceladus or Titan. Uh, so actually, if you understand um, this biochemistry better, Maybe we can understand um, potential life on different uh, other planets. So thank you for listening to me. Actually, I just uh, shared my references with you. Uh, if you want my slides, you can have it. Uh, there are many references uh, in it. So thank you for listening to me. This is my uh, end of presentation. If you have any questions, I will answer. I can answer that. If you don't have, we can end this session.